on the field, yeah. We make some noise. We make noise. We make noise. The black and gold swarms with a heart of steel. Of steel, of steel, of steel. Tomlin's at the helm. ourselves all right it's time for what jen's talking about the conversation about the steelers social media conversation or just screaming into the woods or whatever screaming into the darkness whatever the void the void is the conversation about the steelers void that is social media <laughs> i am kyle Kreis. across from me is greg benevent hello we're here to expose all the week's hot and toxic and conflicting <laughs> takes and feverish oh i didn't get it out in time feverish yeah <laughs> this is the uh yeah this is the ebola of uh of <laughs> weeks on twitter i guess every things are coming out of our everywhere mm -hmm. uh but a, a, but a unique show for us nonetheless while yes. everyone else can speculate and regulate we have a unique show mm -hmm. coming up today the author of the new book on myron cope behind the yoy mm. dan joseph that's coming up in the second mm -hmm. half. Yes. We we got to uh, this is for the old school fans because there's a whole generation now that doesn't even know who Myron Cope might be. I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. um, Dan Joseph is coming up in the second half with the behind the scenes story of behind the yoy. Ooh. So get out your terrible towels. Mm -hmm. That's my this is my '90s towel. There you go. Um. Okay. But we. Put it off. We can't now put it off any longer. <laughs> we tried. It's time for these toxic takes. Ugh. Starting with... It's my quarterback. It's quarterback talk. Yeah, we'll get to Brandon IU. <sighs> sure. We've put it off all summer. Yes. But we'll get to it in a minute. Mm -hmm. First, it's quarterback talk. 
starting with this might even be more toxic <laughs> just as just toxic my fate. first up at tone digs tone digs We've gotten to the portion of camp updates and videos that I'm fully invested in Justin Fields as the starting QB. Uh, it's we're we haven't we're still 48 hours or so, <laughs> 24 to 48 hours away from the first preseason game. Mm -hmm. uh, only by what we've seen at camp, and we haven't seen a whole lot of Ross at camp. So <laughs> I guess uh, we just can't wait it out. We've got to name Justin Fields the starter. Just I mean, he's going to play the two series with the starter uh, uh, starters on Friday night. That's what Tomlin said on Wednesday morning, and that's fine. I That is okay. I mean, I guess we'll get a lot of Kyle Allen and John Reese Plumley, which I will learn how to pronounce correctly just around the time he's cut. <laughs> so uh this so i mean i i i cannot in any good conscience uh, uh back the idea of making fields the starter of this team right now but i can't do that for anyone uh because uh it still has yet to be the first preseason game yeah we ain't seen nothing yet as i think uh bachman turner overdrive <laughs> once said um mm -hmm. but you know it's the the mm -hmm. we, we've lost the walter cronkite of steeler nation <laughs> At Blitzburg, <laughs> Blitzburg, <laughs> the Steelers need to start Justin Fields there. I said it. You know, it's is it just because uh, that's all we've seen? I, you know, it's like there's no patience involved. If if both Russ and Fields were out there practicing, would there this conversation be happening? Or I, I, I don't think so. Something I've heard from watching multiple podcasts, and I think each person individually has brought it up, whether it's Alan Saunders or Christopher Carter or Kovacevic or his Halicki guys, that what they'll say is some version of so many of the Fields highlights you've seen of him making this amazing pass or this run comes after like eight seconds of him being in the pocket, which would never happen in a game, and the defense having already been awarded a sack for the play, but it's not like they're going to blow the whistle in what's essentially flag football, so they let him run the rest of the play, and then you see this video of him making this incredible pass or this amazing run, not realizing that that would absolutely be a seven-yard loss in real life. Yeah, as soon, yeah, exactly. The first time he's what? Well, what? Well, I'm curious. The by Saturday, this whole conversation might be. Oh, Justin can't sit in the pocket. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, especially because the Texans have pretty good pass rush. I mean, they got that Anderson kid, right? Wasn't he defensive rookie of the year or up for it? So I mean, it's you know, it, it very well could be that uh, we we end up with an argument on Saturday of people saying like Fields absolutely can't be the starter versus other people saying Ah, I was here last year and the preseason definitely doesn't matter. So, so yeah, don't it forget. Could go either way. Right? I, we can't. It was just a year ago. The perfect <laughs> preseason. Right. Um, we cannot forget. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're playing their starters in the preseason. Yes. Not that, again, this is preseason, but they're playing their starters. Mm -hmm. And we might be sitting, uh, you know, Marcus Golden might be taking vet rest Absolutely. on this game. So Absolutely. I don't yes. know who's going to be out there. Mm -hmm. Um Well, let's the uh let the speculation and recollation. We can't speculate. When AB has more logic than Steeler Nation. <laughs> That's a bad sign. How about at Skeeter Form and Skeeter Tomzak calling it today. So this was probably Monday. <laughs> calling it today. Justin Fields will be the starting quarterback for the majority of the Steeler games this year. So the majority is nine, unless okay. you include playoffs, right? So, sure. Um, what the over under on uh, nine starts for Justin Fields in 2024? <laughs> I, I assume this person thinks that a uh, Russell's injury is worse than we think, or b he's going to reaggravate it immediately, and that's how Fields is going to start all these games. But I would like to commend the appropriate use of the hashtag fantasy football because that's what this is. <laughs> that, that some of this is that's what it all is. It's like yes. oh you know can I draft him on my fantasy team? And um, <laughs> he looks like he ran so fast. Imagine all the touchdowns he could get running and throwing okay so we're not willing to say the majority of the games but how about at jay bailey nfl reigning hater of the year jarrett bailey 
Justin Fields will be the Steelers starter sooner than later. Maybe not week one, but it will happen. How <laughs> soon is, is sooner? You know, if it's not nine games, the majority, what at what point do you think we could see uh, Justin taking starting reps? Well, going by past precedent, of which there's slightly more than there used to be, I guess we can say by week four, right? Isn't that when Tomlin pulled Mitch and put in Kenny? But uh, I feel like a lot of things would have to happen by that point, uh, namely starting one and three or at the <laughs> potential of one and three. And it also looking very bad in the first half and also them playing teams that certainly they felt they were as good as, if not better than, which I guess could conceivably happen in the first part of this season. But it it feels like for Tomlin to do that early it has to be a hey I really am trying to save the season in this moment kind of thing yeah right Mitch lasted a month mm -hmm. um and it was so it would have to be turnovers wouldn't it that yes. seems to be the uh the equalizer in all these kind of decisions well turnovers and I, I mean I I you know it, it, it's the first half of week four that I think gets analyzed more than a lot of others in Steeler history but I it wasn't so much that Mitch was turning the ball over it's that the offense looked very anemic too wasn't it that Deontay barely yeah. didn't get a foot in and yeah. that led to that fight that may have happened so I think it would have to be a mix of turnovers and the offense looking really bad and the sense of like the season could spiral out of control right here. There was also, it felt like there was division or maybe so-called division in the locker room. Do we believe in our OC? Do we believe in our QB? Right. Um, I guess that was last year, maybe not two years ago, but... There was some of that. I mean, that was there were reports of that two years ago because that led to... Because didn't that come through the DJ and Mitch possible argument shoving mean glares in that uh, halftime? But, yeah, but these are all the things, like, all of this would have to happen again for me to believe it would happen at a, in a month's time, if not longer. Then, of course, the I mean, I think more likely is an injury. Injury yeah. would... Uh, oh, yeah, the 36-year-old yeah. quarterback or whatever who has uh, going to set the all-time record for being sacked. Yeah, that's, that's the way I could very easily see Fields getting a majority of the snaps and being the starter sooner for, uh, than later, particularly with an offensive line that's going to be some young guys figuring it out. Okay, all right. Um, well, let's, uh, let's move on to... At... Najee Adams. Naj. I don't know how Mike Tomlin or the Steelers could talk themselves into starting a 35-year-old injured Russell Wilson over Justin Fields. One, this is an insane throw. Two, the offensive upside the Steelers would have with Justin Fields is incredible. And I didn't I don't have the video, but you know, look, Justin made uh one sweet throw in training camp. Um, you know, no no one blitzing, no right. pressure. Uh, you know, it's like uh, you know, one throw it from 150 yards away in the stands at Latrobe versus you know under the lights at Akershore. I mean, uh, yeah, Justin can make some throws, yes. but you know, so did so could Kenny Pickett, so could uh, so could Mason. They all, you know, they all can make a throw from time to time. Certainly, it, you know, who can do it for 60 minutes? You know? Absolutely, and Fields has a better arm than those guys. But I was just so struck by you saying I don't have the video, and my first thought is neither does this person because <laughs> you don't have this full video. You don't see what happened before this. You don't see how much time Justin took to make this throw or the other ones. You don't see the entire everything that goes into that too. I absolutely just believe that Justin Fields is the best since Young Ben in Latro and having a big arm and hitting a dude in a drill way down the field. I have no doubt of that whatsoever. But I, I keep thinking this is what everyone said was going to happen months ago and it happened and everyone talks like it didn't happen where they said Justin Fields is going to make amazing plays in training camp and everyone's going to say he should start not realizing that that, that it doesn't mean he should start whatsoever. And then that happened and no one <laughs> uh, it remembered. Like it, it, it's, it, it's one thing to have a short memory. It's something else entirely to have a short memory of something that just happened Steeler fans you oh. are out of your freaking mind yep that's right um well let's take the temperature <laughs> of Steeler Nation here we've got at Jack underscore Sperry Jack Sperry your favorite YouTuber <laughs> who 
Who do you want to see as Steelers QB1 to start the season? 58% Justin Fields, 42% Russell Wilson. Um, that, I mean, that's kind of, that's closer than I thought. Uh, you go, you beat me to it. That's exactly what I was about to say. I can't believe the 200 people that responded to this guy were this sensible. Like 40% of them actually thought it through and, um, and weren't just literally uh, entranced by a shiny thing. So, uh, yes, I, I, um, um, it's one of those rare times I get to say thank you for being sensible, Steeler Nation. But still, it's still a majority with the guy yeah. who Tomlin has said every week, uh, nothing has changed. It's right. Russ. Russ is in the pole position. Nothing has changed. Right. Here's the first depth chart. Uh, what did he say? He's like, yeah, you saw what I wrote or something, I think, yes. is what the answer was this week. I think he did say something about, well, there's a competition. Or is everyone like, oh, that means there's a competition. No, that means there's always a competition for everything. That doesn't mean that now we're really giving Fields a chance to do this. And, you know, Tomlin also said that he's not at all worried about Russell's injury whatsoever. So now that doesn't mean that Russell's going to come out and uh, be what he was several years ago. That doesn't mean that Fields can't improve and eventually be the man. All of these things are possible. I just don't think they're possible in early August. Well, let's let's uh, let's phrase it another way. Back to at Jack Sperry. Oh. If Russell Wilson starts all 17 games this year, wins 11 of them, wins a playoff game, and loses in the divisional round, so he's making us a wild card, which QB would you want to start the following year? Now it's a lot tighter. Justin Fields, 52. Russell Wilson, 48. <laughs> if, 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 those, if that five-point scenario plays out to you, uh, how, how do you feel about them? Well, first, I don't feel good about having to answer an entire math word problem <laughs> in the middle of someone's Twitter survey. Like, if Russell Wilson throws three on his... I, I can't make heads or tails of this. Uh, I think th this actually gets back to the conversation you and I have often here about the, oh, Tomlin has to win a playoff game uh, and we come back to, well, it depends on the circumstances. If they blow out a terrible team and in the first round does that mean as much as losing by three points to the eventual Super Bowl champion and it's the same thing with here what happens in this divisional round yeah. how does that game go did, did, did they lose the divisional round because uh, the Chiefs kicked the last second field goal or is it because uh, the Jaguars won by 30 points that I, I feel like I'd have to know all of that and you think well that's asking extra context of it the dude wrote out an entire story for this thing he could have included that in it too <laughs> that is a reasonable expectation. Yeah, um, I'm in this situation. Yeah, I mean, le basically, 11, you're saying 11 wins. I think I, I would stick. I, I, would, I think I'd I would want to stick with. I'd want to stick with it. Yeah, it's and it, I could see letting Fields go at that point. Yeah, it's it's. But if if but if, by the same token, if it's Fields is the guy doing this, then I'm definitely fine with letting Russell go. I think yeah. th th it's it's this is this is really a question about Russell more so than it is Fields when you really look at it. Unless Russ is like, hey, I'll stick around and play for you know the, the, for less money, then we get into that whole conversation. Yes, which we've got yes, yes. thirteen months to oh, worry about man. that. It's it, I mean the only thing about that is that won't be better than mock drafts in March. <laughs> okay, how about? Okay, well let's uh, yeah let's do this. Let's go to this one. We're, okay. we're already spending like twenty minutes on quarterback talk. <laughs> At Mike Up Sports One, Mike Nicastro. Okay, Justin Fields is exciting. He was never put in a great spot, but I think we're all forgetting. Neither was Russell Wilson, Nathaniel Hackett, the ghost of Sean Payton. We're also neglecting the fact that Wilson was very good in a bad situation last year, and we've got the comparison between Russell Wilson and Lamar Jackson and. And basically, you know, Russ had 3,070 yards versus uh, Lamar's 3,600 yards. Mm -hmm. Russ had a 66.4 completion percentage versus Lamar's 67.2 completion percentage. Russ threw 26 touchdowns versus Lamar's 24 touchdowns. So they're trying to say that Ru Russell Wilson is no different than Lamar Jackson, <laughs> except that... Uh, I, don't Steeler fans say Lamar Jackson is a running back, not a quarterback? Right. I mean, you, you beat me, too. I was actually going to say, even without my glasses, I can look and see that those rushing yard stats are quite different. I mean, the passing stats may be uh, fairly similar, sure. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's rare the game where the Steelers have feared Lamar's arm more than his feet. It, but they all, by that same token, the Steelers didn't sign Russell Wilson to be Lamar Jackson. Not at this point no. in his career. It, I, I do like 
like that the Nicastro person said, pump the brakes. That's a kinder way than I would have put it. But it is nice <laughs> to see uh, every now and then, and I know it's not what our show is about, but it is nice to see someone put a, if not a totally sensible, then at least a uh, countering the main narrative argument here on our show. Well, if we look at these stats, uh, passing 26 passing touchdowns is an improvement from last yes. year, and 3,000 passing yards is an improvement from last year. So, mm -hmm. um, if if we want to just compare 2023 to 2024, uh, that's a step. You know, I'll take Denver Broncos Russell Wilson <laughs> over 2023's. Uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, and, and I'm always a little nervous about that because the Broncos were kind of out of some of those games, and maybe there were some garbage time points in there. But I, I, I obviously there's no stat that says, "Oh, we'll eliminate garbage time for you." But I, even just even with that caveat, though, the, the if the Steelers had, had this play out of their quarterback last year, they're probably not going to Buffalo in that first game. Yeah, right. They're uh, they're go where, where are we I going? I don't know where they're going, going to, to figure Kansas out where they're City. Going. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, or Houston again, where they got blown out. I'm not sure it's a better answer, but I, they're definitely. Well, they actually, yeah, since that's where Cleveland went. Yeah, so that Houston's actually probably the better answer. <laughs> All right, one last thing, and we saved the worst for last at. Steeler Nation, <laughs> Steeler Nation. Insider believes uh, quarterback Russell Wilson's calf injury could result in an early retirement. And this is uh, this is from uh, Mike Florio. Mm. You know, if, if Russ doesn't start in 2024, how will he get a starting job in 2025? And so his logic is, you know, if for whatever reason he loses this to Justin Fields, that'll be that'll be it for him. I mean, we're only seven months removed from Joe Flacco starting a playoff game. <laughs> that just happened in the year of our Lord, 2024. It, I, I mean, it can't help Russell's career, but man, oh man, that is, uh, that is a lot. That would be the pushing a blocking sled heard round the world no quarterback would ever push a blocking sled again okay enough uh, qb talk let's get to the real sauce that's <laughs> just dirty rumors there it's, it is. it's it's time for the dirty rumors <laughs> that's right okay like so at this point uh, by the time you're hearing this, uh, who knows? Maybe by the time we're recording this, should I right. check uh, Twitter real I, quick? I, I, I'm resisting doing it until later. Okay, we're talking Brandon Ayuk. Let's just it's it, the 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 reporting or the the rumoring is so ridiculous. It's been awful. Let's see how quickly we can just kind of go through some of what has gone down. Uh, since mon since Monday, not even since <laughs> right, March, right? But just uh, just this week so far. Let's start with <laughs> at Marino NFL Cam Marino. This is uh, comes down on Monday. Breaking the Steelers and 49ers have agreed to a trade that sends star receiver Brandon Ike to Pittsburgh. Now this guy writes for <laughs> NFLDraftBuzz.com, not on my bookmarks list yet. But oh they had they've posted five articles in the last month. Three of them happen to be on EA Sports uh, ratings. <laughs> And of course, Andrew Filipponi from the so-called fan ran with this guy. This yes, is where this is where it seemed to start. Okay, yes. so that's uh, this is where it, this is where the ridiculousness started. Mm -hmm. But then to up the ante, we've got at <laughs> Pretty Ricky two one three, Ricky. My back is against the wall, but Brendan Ayuk will be a Pittsburgh Steeler. I'm going out on top. I can't tell if this is a joke account. This guy has 44,000 followers, yes. but it's an account that just started in April. Mm -hmm. And then, then people are like, then subtweeting like, oh, I stand with Ricky and, you know, Ricky knows it and all this stuff. I can't tell if it's just like, like... You know, we're having fun. It's it's satire, parody. He, he, he allegedly, and I forget what it was, he did get one thing right about somebody that he was that he doubled down in the same fashion in the course since this account with this dog started. I forget who it was because somebody I want to say it was like uh, somebody it's somebody retweeted him and it said, well, he got this other thing right. That wasn't Steelers related, but it was something else that happened in the offseason. I don't forget who. And I think that was sort of the credit that gave whatever credibility there is to this person using. Is that Spuds McKenzie? Yeah. OK, yeah. so that's that uh, God, I'm old. But yeah, so that's so I think that's where it comes from. None of that 
that is why it explains why this person has 44,000 followers, nor the hashtag trust Ricky, which a shocking a number of people do and use. Yeah, I it's like I and I was really getting frustrated with the people who were like having fun with it. Like, yeah, we're standing with this guy. You know, it's like, no, I'm <laughs> I'm I'm looking for real real takes. Right, not- <laughs> right. Or even just somebody I mean, I, I understand wanting to have fun on social media because there's not much of it to be had there. But again, it, this is you know, it's a guy with a dog uh, as his avatar. I mean, you can complain about being misinformed, and that's a legitimate complaint, but it doesn't help if you seek out misinformation or the potential for misinformation yeah this is just about as reliable as uh what did we have uh last season you know a friend of jersey jerry that's uh, right jersey text, jerry's pal yeah texting you know uh alan saunders or whatever i mean that's why we make the j- cracks about bookies.com because yeah. it's as silly as that is it has more credibility than a guy with a dog avatar from a super bowl commercial from 40 years ago um, okay, then we got some, I think, kind of legitimate reports. Yeah, well, this is a guy, at least, that has written an article since the draft. We've got at Schultz Report, Jordan Schultz, uh, sources, there's currently no trade in place for all pro wideout Brennan Ayuk to the Steelers. Uh, 49ers had discussions, but as of this post, nothing was fine. This is, again, Monday, I believe, still. Okay. Um, but, but... Oh, he he was saying the Steelers declined to meet the 49ers trade demands. Okay. So it was like, okay, well, what what would the 49ers trade demands be? Well, mm-hmm. luckily we've got mm-hmm. at, well, uh, no, let's go to at the Pony Express, Andrew <laughs> Filipponi. Here's what I've heard the Steelers are willing to put into a trade for Brendan Ayuk. Dan Moore Jr., James Daniels, Calvin Austin, uh, a second round pick. But I've heard the 49ers want one of these back. A first-round pick, Pat Fryermuth, George Pickens. Um, you know, what? Uh, mm. I'm certainly not trading Pickens or Fryermuth. No. Um, I don't really want to do a first round, but if that's what it comes to, fine. Yeah. Now, what about the, you know, how interesting would, like, a second round with a Dan Moore or a James Daniels or a Calvin Austin? Is that... Is that to hurt? You know, I mean, our line seems pretty young as is. Is that shooting ourselves in the foot? I to- mean, it would it would hurt, but it also comes under the heading of a big price for a big payoff, which was the headline in the Post Gazette when Craig Patrick traded for Ron Francis and Old Samuelson. Um, so it would be a big price for a big payoff. It would be a lot, but you'd get a lot in return. And I think that's part of that's. I mean, I I don't want to have to speculate about this at all, but the one thing that makes sense to me as to what's held this trade up isn't so much that the Steelers can't necessarily meet the Niners' price. It's that they can't give the Niners what the Niners really need, which is something that can help them to win the Super Bowl right now this year, which is even a first-round pick doesn't do that. I mean, the Niners are built to win everything, and what can the Steelers give them that could conceivably help them do that? Dan Moore Jr.? Yeah. If one of their tack that got the best tackle in the world, Trent Williams, if he gets hurt, if the other guy gets hurt, maybe Dan Moore beats out the other guy. That could happen. James Daniels? Absolutely. He'd start for the Niners. He's better than the guards they got. I know that because people that actually know the Niners have said that. Uh, Calvin Austin? I mean, I guess if you need a real fast fourth wide receiver while they're covering the other three guys, including Debo, who presumably still gets two and Kittle gets two, then sure. But um, but yeah, I, I if the Steelers trade Friar Mouth or Pickens, okay, then they have to start calling somebody else to trade for their wide receiver again because we're back in the same issue they've been at ever since DJ got traded to the Panthers. Right. If only we'd have held on to DJ. If we only, if, I blame Kenny. If only we knew Kenny was going to be a quitter, <laughs> then we could have kept DJ, not worried about any of this right now. And we'd be still all fired up, you know. Um, okay, well, let's continue. Okay, let's uh, let's get to some more Steeler sources. <laughs> we've got. Come on, uh, thank you. Okay, mm-hmm. now we've got at Chris Hallicky. Uh, Chris Hallicky, this is from DK Sports. The Steelers are. Re- this is Tuesday now. The right. Steelers are reportedly out of the mix for mm-hmm. Brandon Ayuk, but I have some thoughts in our Steelers feed. What are his thoughts? Uh, I'm the mind reader here. See, he believes the Niners were leaking false info to get Khan to up his offer. Yes. Now that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Now that explains why all these blue checkmark accounts claim to have these sources. If because you know these guys. 
uh, have important jobs to do than to be on their phones all day texting uh, mm -hmm. Blue Check Beck here or whatever. Yes, yes. And to piggyback on top of that, by Wednesday morning, Patriots media people had said the same thing that the Patriots were only included in this whatsoever to jack up the price from the Steelers, uh, which which also makes sense. I mean, that's, you know, what, what the Patriots could give them wide receiver and uh, a bunch of draft picks, but why are the Patriots a team that is literally rebuilding, uh, trading a first-round pick and giving uh, $80 million to a receiver for a team that's going to need a lot more than a receiver to be the great Patriots again? So it is entirely possible that's what happened, that the Niners leaked that to with the Pats and especially the Browns. That, yeah. And putting that out there, too, a team that is already $60 million over the salary cap. and uh, uh, But could conceivably trade Amari Cooper for uh, Ayuk. So, I mean, that that landed out there enough. But, yes. It's, uh, and also, it seems like a Browns thing, right? Just trade oh, yeah. for the biggest wide receiver out there, too. So, if that's, if that's what the Niners did, that's a clever move. I don't know if it worked, but that's a clever move. I almost wish he was the Browns, just so he could be like, yeah, next year you're going to have to start, uh, you know, 10 undrafted rookies. Because, right, yeah. but they also beat the Steelers with a third round, uh, with a third quarterback last year. It was taken like the fifth or sixth round. It, uh, so I mean, okay, these things can okay, happen. Okay, okay. Like, let's let's leave that in the past. <laughs> um, okay, then then we find then we got the official insider, oh, the national insider. Here we go. At Adam Schefter, Adam Schefter, who went on, I believe he was on Pat McAfee saying Steelers are out of it. Yes. But then two hours later. He comes back, Steelers and 49ers re-engaged in conversations <laughs> midday today. Mm -hmm. uh, as of Monday night, the talks had stalled, but now there are further conversations. <laughs> so after he had went on Pat McAfee, he said, eh, it's not the Steelers. Then so obviously someone talked to him. Yes. Um, okay. So that was the national, that was finally someone on the national level weighing right. in. Mm -hmm. um, now, how about the only take that made sense, that makes sense to me? Okay. Tell me what you think about at uh -oh. back nine Steve, Steve oh. on the block. Okay. There's a connection a lot of people seem to forget about. Khan might be working out the details on Ayuk, but Tomlin is doing the talking. Don't mm. forget that Tomlin was the was a coach at Tampa Bay right. when John Lynch was still a player. He was a secondary <laughs> coach. So it makes me think, because um, relationships always play a part in these things. Absolutely. And, you know, do you think that... Tomlin is the one on the phone uh, with John Lynch at some point this week. I, I don't think that's impossible. I would imagine he would be included at some point since if there's one thing I think we can ascertain from all this nonsense is that there have been a lot of conversations uh, between uh, the Steelers and uh, uh, the Niners. I also think kind of on top of that, it's – it, the other thing that I've heard in enough places, and that's the problem with this kind of propaganda, is when you hear something in enough places, whether or not it's true, you tend to believe it. So I'm very much there right now, is that Ayuk does want to come to the Steelers, and a significant portion of that has to be Tomlin. Oh, definitely, definitely. So I, I, I think if this works out, this could very well be like the ultimate guys want to play for Tomlin the apex of that, the clearest and most definitive and perhaps most beneficial sign of that in a long, long time. I just think that if they're if they really, you know, can't come to some agreement, Tomlin gets on the phone and is like, come on, John. You know, like Tiki Barber <laughs> invited Tomlin to put on the gold jacket. You telling me that Tomlin can't get on the phone with John Lynch and say, what can we do to, to make this happen? Oh, I'm sure uh, Tomlin can, and I'm sure that would carry weight with John Lynch. But I also understand John Lynch is an excellent general manager who's built a consistent Super Bowl contender and is much as he likes Tomlin, and I'm sure he loves Tomlin on some level, he's not going to just give him an all-pro wide receiver because Mike gave him a call. But it can't. But you're, to your point, which is correct, it can't hurt. Yeah, all these relationships absolutely do matter, as they do in all businesses, and particularly this very human one. Um. Now let's give the. Well, it won't even be the final word. Let's give the pent ultimate final word. The most recent final word. The second. This is how about the second to most recent. We've got at ninety three seven the fan ninety three seven the so called fan. Are you happening? The Pony <laughs> Express says a verbal agreement is in place. Um, Wednesday morning. So a verbal agreement. What's the difference between a verbal agreement and then just announcing it? I mean, you know, we got to sign some papers. How long does that take? A verbal agreement. Right. 
Right. Yes, that's what I always wonder too. Well, if we agreed to it, it's. It, I mean, it's not like we didn't. We can't draw up these papers rather quickly. It's not like our lawyers aren't uh, on the uh, contact list here. You know, but you got to consider the source, Andrew Filipponi. I loved what Jim Wexel said. He was he wouldn't even name him by name. He was like, you know, some people on the radio who aren't in the locker room who haven't been at camp at all yet um who have no sources <laughs> higher up you know he's saying all the all the higher up sources are telling him hey we'll go with van jefferson mm -hmm. um and he and wexel was like you know if you're going to hear it from anyone they omar Khan talks to the pittsburgh post gazette um you know they've been in the business the longest if you're going to hear it from anyone that's who you're going to hear it from mm -hmm. so Coming, coming in uh, Wednesday afternoon here, we've got it from oh, at Jerry Dulac. It's uh, Jerry Dulac, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. The Steelers have no verbal agreement in place with the 49ers, are not in the process of hammering out final details. Mm -hmm. Any potential detail would not involve the Steelers giving up a player. Right. So that comes from Dulac. Is that the final word until, uh, you know, until someone else tweets something else? Until someone else tweets something else. I mean, I am now I am a little nervous that for all the times we've had, we've mentioned Dulac as being someone who's wrong on this show. Now we're kind of <laughs> listening to him. But um, I did. I, I thought Tomlin's response to this was lovely uh, Wednesday morning when someone said something about like, oh, are you thinking of adding to the wide receiver room? And he, his, his exact, or, are you thinking of adding to this team? He said, well, not yet. It's early yet on the West Coast. <laughs> which is also pretty clever but um but i mean it i i it, it's you know i do hope it's resolved soon one way or the other i think this guy helps this team i think if he comes it leads to a whole absolute other craziness but man am i tired of hearing about it like it's i'm tired of hearing about it to this point in a way i haven't been tired of hearing about something that doesn't involve an actual loss or mock drafts like that's where <laughs> i am with this already mm -hmm. and again there's a game friday night That'll be the last time that I address it. I, uh, I don't think. Yeah, I be, wish. Be, we wouldn't be surprised if we don't. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's it. We've gone so long in this first half. Let's take a break. We've got coming up in the second half the author of Behind the Yoy, the new book on Myron Cope. We'll also actually talk about some things that happened at camp. How about that? Imagine that. Um, all right. Stay tuned. That's coming up. In a moment, on what Jin's talking about. We're Pittsburgh and we're Patriot. Steelers fans, imagine all the world's greatest songs about the world's greatest football team Jesse, always got it. Jesse, always in a once in a lifetime collection. What Jin's talking about presents Steelers Songs, Volume One. 30 Pittsburgh songs, all about the black and gold. From Mike Tomlin. The standard is the standard when you're listening to Tomlin is To Russell Wilson. Let Russ cook, oh let him soar through skies of black and gold. And Cam Hayward. Cam, don't go to Cleveland. Get the Steelers songs collection on two CDs or two cassettes for just $26.99. Who is gonna catch the ball? Or completely free on your favorite streaming service. You say you're black and gold, but your face are full of it. Turn your time. That's right, iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio. These songs will have you reaching for your terrible towel. Satisfaction guaranteed. Steeler Songs Volume 1 is not sold in stores. No, no, no. We don't want no H people. So don't be a jagoff. Listen to Steeler Songs Volume 1 now. Only from what Jin's talking about. The conversation about the Steelers conversation. You can see the black and gold when we hit in the Super Bowl. Alright, welcome back. It's time to grab your terrible towels. Very excited to talk to today's guest, the author of the upcoming book, Behind the Yoy, The Life of Myron Cope, legendary Pittsburgh Steelers broadcaster, author Dan Joseph. Welcome to What Jin's Talking About. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks for having me. 
Uh, You know, Cope is one of my favorite figures in Steelers history. The book is in stores everywhere September 1st. Now, you know, Myron had already written his autobiography before he passed. So what inspired you to revisit his legacy? Well, um, Elizabeth Cope, Myron's daughter, yeah, she had wanted to do something more about her dad. She had all his papers, his contracts, his correspondence, his, his, a lot of his tapes from his radio and TV work. And she thought, you know, there's, there's more here to the story. Um, and there was, there, there was a lot more to the story. Uh, and so we kind of made contact and we decided that we're going to do an even more in-depth biography of Myron. I focused on the, his career, uh, which is, you know, in terms of the career, Pittsburghers got to see the second half of Myron's life, but, but there's a whole interesting first half. Uh, he was a writer for the Post-Gazette who uh, rose to being a very prominent writer for major national magazines like Life and Look and the Saturday Evening Post and most famously Sports Illustrated. And these these are the days when the magazines had like three, four, five million circulation. Uh, he he made big money doing this, and he he got to interview a lot of really interesting people. Um, started off doing Pittsburgh guys. He he did like he made his living off the nineteen sixty Pirates. You know when they won the World Series. All those guys. He he did profiles on Roy Face and Dick Stewart and Danny Murtaugh and all those guys. But then he ascended to doing superstars. He did uh, Jerry West, Elgin Baylor, Red Arbach, Jim Brown. He wrote Jim Brown's. He, or he, he ghost wrote Jim Brown's autobiography, which oh. is kind of funny. It, you know, you have the, the face of the Browns and the voice of the Steelers collaborating. And it, it, it it's funny if you read the book. They like they almost cancel each other out. It doesn't sound like <laughs> Myron and it doesn't sound like Jim Brown. But, you know, um, and then but he also he got a reputation as being the nut specialist. He would write about really these these quirky characters um, some of which were in Pittsburgh, like a guy named Mossy Murphy, who was the chief recruiter and cheerleader of the Duquesne basketball team, even though he was short and rotund and <laughs> uh, not a basketball player at all. But he was sort of like the driving force behind the program. And, uh, and Muhammad Ali, you know, he wrote about Muhammad Ali not only obviously as a superstar, but also this very charismatic and very loud, very uh, loquacious 20 year old when the guy before he was champ, uh, he, he wrote he wrote one of the very first big articles of Muhammad Ali and Howard Cosell, people like that. Um, and so there was that whole aspect to his life, which he, he had kind of touched on in his autobiography, but it never really it had never really been examined. So I, I, I enjoyed digging into all that. Were there things that surprised going through all the archival stuff, things that maybe uh, even his daughter wasn't aware of, things that surprised, you know, that was just kind of maybe kept under wraps for all this time? Yeah. um, Like, you know, Myron in his book, he did mention changing his name. You know, he was born as Myron Copeland. Um, And a writer, when he joined the Post Gazette, an editor told him, you're going to have to change your name because. We don't want too many Jewish names in the newspaper. So a guy literally changed it. The editor shortened it from Copeland to Cope and changed it from a K to a C. And what one of the interesting things was Myron, I think, instinctively knew Myron Cope is a punchier name than Myron Copeland. And when he was just 25 years old, he switched it legally. Uh, And, you know, I, I asked Elizabeth Cope when I first met her, is your real name Cope or Copeland? And it and it was Cope. It, it always had been Cope because Myron had changed it very early on. He uh, he actually had a flair that you know I, I think all Pittsburghers remember what a flair he had for promoting himself and the terrible towel and the Steelers and the Steeler players. But this showed up very early in his life. Um, there were a lot of pictures of him, uh, you know, almost like. Not a lot, but just there's some like almost movie star handsome type pictures. He was <laughs> he was getting publicity photos when he was in his twenties, and trying to rise up his, nationally to start writing for these magazines. Um, 
So all that was surprising. And, and there were, you know, there were parts of his story that he left out of his autobiography. Um, you know, he, he talked about leaving the Post-Gazette for, to, to launch a freelance writing career. He left out that he had returned to the Post-Gazette to do freelance for them. He, and his, his very last story for the paper was Game 7 of the 1960 World Series when Mazeroski hit the home run. Um, and he wrote the the game account the next day. And it's a wonderful piece of writing that he did probably on like four or five hours deadline. Uh, it, it, there's just a, a whole lot of stories that I hadn't really been, he hadn't touched and nobody else had touched on. His right, you know, reading, I, I went back and read the Cassius Clay piece and his writing style, you don't, it's not, it's different than his broadcasting style, you know, I don't, was that, uh, was that a conscious choice, do you think, or is it just that the, you, with the prose, you just have, you know, you can be, have more time to be more eloquent and. Well, he, he could be more eloquent as a writer. He liked being more eloquent. In fact, he, he always thought of himself first as a writer. Um, what's interesting, and I, I found this out from talking to family members and friends from the early days, he, uh, the, the, the words and the persona we associate with Myron Cope today, that all started to evolve once he got on the radio. It really wasn't his natural character when he was a young guy. He, he didn't say yoy. Yeah. He didn't say... Mm -ha, and okul dokul and, and all those things that all came after he began uh broadcasting um so it, there was kind of a there's a kind of a dividing line in his life you know the the pre-broadcasting days and then the the broadcasting days and once he got on the radio he suddenly realized he was a ham he that he had this other side to him and that that really liked being in front of a microphone and and to, as, to a somewhat lesser extent being on camera he really he preferred radio to tv i think the so the the cassius clay piece was in 63 that, that got him national accolades obviously you know he was already on the radar as an olympic medalist but was you know was was cope kind of visionary in seeing you know the great the greatness in clay at that point i i don't think he was a i mean i think other people saw that Cassius Clay was becoming, he, he had the, the speed and the, the power to become champ already. And of course he was attracting attention all over the place because he was so, he, he was the, I don't know if the first, but one of the first boxers to really uh, make a conscious effort, who's eloquent enough and loquacious enough to grab the press's attention and make TV appearances and, and utter more than, you know, a, a couple words here and there, he he was a, uh, you know, he was a personality. So Myron wasn't alone in doing that. Um, the uh, so you know, Cope. Did, well, for, did they stay in touch at all? Did he stay in touch with Ali later? Later, I I he did a second magazine piece on Ali once well, after he changed his name, and I think and then he went up to that famous um, fight in when Ali fought. Uh, Sonny Liston a second time. He was there in Lewiston, Maine when that happened. Uh, and then after that, I think Myron's career path kind of took him away from from boxing and, you know, obviously tore the Steelers. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Cope is working for WTAE when the Steelers, you know, switch stations from KDKA to WTAE and that kind of starts him as the Steelers guy. Was it that serendipitous that he was just right place, right time? Or was, you know, uh, who made that decision to, from the Steelers to hire him? The, the Steelers were switching from KDKA to, T, to WTAE because at KDKA, they were the, the third wheel, the extra weights, the dead weight. Uh, KDK put them on tape delay, you know, things like that. WTAE wanted them on live and promote them heavily. And Myron, of course, was a, was an employee already at the station. And the Steelers already liked, they were very familiar with Myron because he had hung out with the team for years going back to the 50s. And so they they wanted him. They asked him to be the um, the uh, commentator on the games. And, you know, he, he said, well, you know what, I've never done this. I've never... <laughs> been on the radio before but they said give it a try <laughs> uh, somebody on, i think joe gordon 
uh, who was the Steelers publicist for many years, he and a guy named Ed Kiley, who was sort of also public relations, I think they were the ones who saw that Myron could be good at, at being the radio guy. And, and they were so right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was 70. OK, um, well, Franco is drafted and a year later, I believe, uh, Cope had a role in getting Sinatra and Franco together, right? What, what was, yeah. how did, how did he pull that off? Well, okay. 72, that's the year the Steelers take off. And Myron, he was very central in promoting Franco's Italian army, that the army the, and, and Jarella's guerrillas too. This, this, this is a couple chapters alone in the book, okay. how Jarella's guerrillas and Franco's Italian army, they kind of went to cope, to cope and he it reciprocated and became a good, a great two way relationship so the Steelers were out in California preparing for the last game of the season. And Tony Stagno, who was the head of Franco's Italian Army, just said, hey, you know, while you're out there, try to get Sinatra into the Army. Because the Steelers were practicing about 10 minutes away, I think, from Frank Sinatra's house. <laughs> and so one night, the Steelers are, you know, after practice, they're in a restaurant and with Coke with about like 10 assorted Steeler figures. And there's Sinatra in, on an, at another table. And, and Myron never got tired of telling this story. Uh, basically, he got a cocktail napkin, wrote a note, had it sent over, and, and Sinatra came over and started talking to them. And Myron basically talked him in, into coming to practice. And this this goes to show, show how much charisma and chutzpah that Myron had because I mean here's a total stranger yeah. he never met Frank Sinatra before and, and why would Sinatra even know about Franco's Italian Army but he he got him over to practice the next day and um that was like one of the centerpieces of Myron's after dinner presentation for for years afterwards <laughs> the the terrible towel comes around in 75 you know we we know today how things go viral back then it was probably a lot more difficult to spread the word you know how how long did it take for the towel to become kind of the institution that we know today well it was, he actually did it very quickly because now obviously there's no social media but he um he had daily commentaries on wtae radio and he had his talk show and then he was on the six o'clock news a couple times a week and so pretty much over the course of two weeks he promoted it heavily and Steeler fans already were kind of used to doing what Myron said. And he he would tell Jarella's Gorillas, I want you to make a sign to psych out the other kicker, the opposition kicker in the end zone, and they would do it. So, you know, 30,000 towels appeared at, at Three River Stadium when the uh, Steelers played the Colts in the playoffs. And then it just kept going from there. Uh, they did it at the championship and at the Super Bowl. And then... It kind of, it, it was sort of a do-it-yourself thing for a couple of years. And then in 78, somebody from Gimbel's department store contacted Myron and said, hey, can we sell this? Let's, let's make an official towel. Myron went along with it and it got, they did ads in the paper and things like that. And Myron doubled down on the towel and the broadcast. And it just, it, and that 78 is really the point where it goes from being, you know, just another kind of team gimmick to being the flag of Steelers Nation and becoming so central to the team's identity and the city's identity too. And, and in the book, which I will hear conveniently nice. for a second, <laughs> um, I have a whole chapter on how Myron, you know, it's never really been answered how much money he made off of it or what the contractual arrangements were. So one of the things about going into his papers was that I got to see like the original contracts for the towel and the royalty statements and how it, it, it kind of, I don't want to say it saved Gimbel's, but it really lifted Gimbel's <laughs> fortunes for a while. Because if you remember, uh, they had terrible towel rooms in all their department stores. <laughs> it was a whole room, it, not just the towel. I mean, they had the terrible uh, shot glass and the terrible <laughs> ashtray and the terrible <laughs> baby bib and things like that. They had t terrible T-shirts. And, um, you know, so I got to see all kind of behind the scenes how that all worked out. Uh, and then, of course, how he, even from the beginning, Myron was donating large sums of money to uh, the Society for Autistic Children because his son uh, was and is autistic. And then later on, 
it, he permanently gave the money to the Allegheny Valley School for people with disabilities. And that's where all what what what, what were Myron's royalties now go to that school uh, every month. Yeah, that's so uh, altruistic. Um, now, Cope seems to be one of the few people to get close to Chuck Knoll, uh, even more so than maybe some players. Um, you know, how, why was Noel so at ease with Cope? And like, how did that relationship foster? No, okay, apparently, now, Myron said it took him five years to get Noel to trust him. <laughs> but once they did, I mean, it's it's funny, I, I, I have a tape of the, you know, the coaches show, you know, that they did yeah. before the broadcast. And this is like before the 72 AFC championship game. And it's the week after the Immaculate Reception. And you can't tell Noah's even a little bit excited. He, <laughs> he it, it could be like an exhibition game against Atlanta with all the excitement in his voice. But um, they, they got to know each other. They both lived in Upper St. Clair. Okay. And after a while, Noel would come over to the coach's house to tape the uh, coach's show. And Myron was legendarily bad at fixing anything. Uh, Noel was good at fixing, you know, a stereo, a dishwasher, whatever. So he would, you know, routinely go over and, and fix the stereo or change the light, the broken light bulb or something. And then they would sit down uh, and do the interview. And Elizabeth Cope was telling me that for years, she thought of Chuck Knoll as the uh, family handyman. She had no idea <laughs> that <laughs> that he was the coach of the Steelers when when uh, she was little. So uh, they, they, they got to trust each other. And then when Noel retired, one of his very first interviews was on Myron's talk show. And and if I may throw in a tiny plug here, that is on the Myron Cope channel, which you can find on YouTube, where Noel talks about his decision uh, not to draft Dan Marino, for example, oh. in the 1983 draft. So look for that on YouTube, the Myron Cope channel. Oh, definitely. Ones. Yeah, I want to find that. I, I yeah. see that there's been more content going on that channel. Is that Elizabeth? Do you have a role in that? Who's who's uh, hosting that? Elizabeth has all of Myron's tapes, and I kind of just I I get them up there. <laughs> Is there a is there a good uh, there's not a, a, a really a great place to find certainly old broadcasts let alone you know Myron Cope on sports or anything like that you know is does she have a pretty vast archive of that stuff now or I, w I wouldn't say vast My Myron apparently would save if he thought like a commentary or a talk show or a commercial had come out really good he would keep the tape and he would literally throw it into a box. And so she has boxes and or bags of stuff that that he saved. Um, he didn't. He certainly didn't save all of his talk shows, but he or or commentaries. But he saved a, a good portion of them. So, well, you know, yeah, I'm looking we're, forward we're to get them up there. Yeah, definitely looking forward to seeing more things from that. You know, I was trying to think what exactly is Cope's legacy. You know, today not many broadcasters have a unique voice or style it seems like many are you know trying to i don't want to say i'll be like you know broadcasting professional type thing you would think that cope's legacy would inspire more people to be unique um well, you know why what is his legacy do you think these days well i see not too many people can copy him because he's that voice is almost, you can't replicate that voice. AI could not even replicate <laughs> that voice and get it right, I think. Um, he, I, I don't really know. I, I would think more people would be inspired to be unique like him because uh, he, he had such success doing it. He was so, he stood out so well. Um, legacy... I mean, his real legacy is the terrible towel, certainly. Yeah. And th this uh, collection of Steeler moments that he captured uh, over the 35 years in the booth and also, you know, doing, you know, just talking to the players. He he had good rapport with uh, a lot of the players, especially in the 70s, but, but even after. And, uh, you know, it, I think it made the whole Steeler experience more enjoyable. For Steeler fans, actually, uh, I talked to Bob Smizek, who used to be a, a columnist for the Post Gazette and earlier the Pittsburgh Press, and he he told me he thinks that the Steelers captured the city, the city's heart, so much in part because of Myron Cope. 
because uh, he connected the players to the fans. So well, more so, especially in the days before social media, mm-hmm. you know, you had to go through somebody, and the the channel to the fans was Cope, and it worked the other way. The channel from the fans to the players was Myron Cope, and Rocky Blyer said, you know, that this this was he, the players appreciated going on Cope's talk show because that was the way they could connect with uh, the fan base. Um, now I know he retired uh, before the Super Bowl forty, and I believe he might have even even been battling pneumonia at that time. Was there any consideration to try to come back for uh, that playoff run or that Super Bowl? Yeah, we 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 talk about that a little bit in the book. Uh, Dan Rooney uh, offered to bring Cope back for Super Bowl forty. Was yeah. it the one the one in Detroit? But Myron's voice by that time. You know, he was a heavy, heavy smoker. He had been battling pneumonia. And he his whole immune system was kind of, he, he was just wearing down. His voice had worn down. And so he decided not to do it. He he thought it, he wasn't up to it, basically. He, he did try to revive his career, though, his writing career, after he retired. And that that's in the book. He, he tried uh, writing for Sports Illustrated again and wrote an article about the 2006 Steelers. The year after the Super Bowl, and and that that was an interesting, um, you know, incident in his life. Yeah. But, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's. Oh, I might yeah. have to try to find that. Um, well, the, you know, the book is behind the Yoy drops September first from Nebraska Press. Uh, Dan, anything you personally want to promote before we uh, take off? Um, I I just hope. Oh, I'm gonna. We're doing a book signing. Okay. Uh, at Barnes and Noble in South Hills Village on September sixth, uh, it's on. You, you can sign up for it on the Barnes and Noble Upper St. Clair or South Hills Village website. Um, and hopefully, we'll be doing some other things as well. And just you know, thanks for having me on. No, thank you. I love it. Behind the Yoy, def, you know, must read uh, this season. Uh, you know, well, if, especially if you remember him, or even if you don't, now it's hard to believe that it's been you know 15 years. Now there's probably a whole generation of fans that uh, missed out on that. So, but but you know, on the on the website on the YouTube channel, we actually get I, you can see the ages of people who tune in, and we do get people like in their in the 15 to 24 range or the 25 to 35 range. People, you know, Myron's entertaining. The great thing about his commentaries, especially, is. You didn't have to be there to appreciate some of these commentaries. They're just funny. Definitely, definitely. Well, uh, thank you, Dan, for your time. Uh, congrats with the book, and good luck, and I hope it's a big success. Thank you. All right. Big thanks to Dan Joseph for giving us a time to talk about Myron Cope. Um, you know, the book comes out September 1st. Mm-hmm. Uh, we will be giving away a copy. So, again, if you want to get in on the giveaway, I want uh, an iTunes review would be nice. Yes. Um, you know, subscribe to YouTube. Uh, leave a comment on YouTube. Um, we got the Myron Cope book. We've got Yay. the Dick LeBeau book. We've got uh, LeVon Kirkland's kids books. Uh, so back to school season. I don't know. Books. A lot of books. A lot of mm-hmm. books. Maybe I'll even uh, maybe I'll throw in my my terrible towel. The one of them. Steelers Library. Um, let's talk about some things that actually happened. Hey, let's, you know, let's skip on 53 man predictions. Okay. It's, we, we still haven't had a preseason game, so that's fine. Yeah. We can wait to do that. Let's instead, how about this hot take <laughs> at Steelers underscore Chris B, Chris Barbara Steelers chemistry may not be as well as it seems. Ugh. Wow. I had to click this. What? <laughs> Because when Tomlin was asked about the chemistry between Justin Fields and George Pickens, Tomlin said, I could throw the ball to George, too. (laughs) And from that quote, yeah, from that quote, though, we've got the Steelers chemistry may not be as well as it seems. Wow. I mean, that's that. How do I want to word this? Like. I have to imagine this person's more intelligent than I thought they were for them to misinterpret this so deliberately maliciously. <laughs> yeah, you know, instead of coming up with unique content, you hey, you know, like you could click over and read my article about why Willie Parker was too premature for the Hall of Honor, which got some hate comments. But at least that is some uh, original thinking. Instead and it's of- also something you genuinely believe. 
Yeah. Like yeah. as opposed to this, which is clearly nonsense. Like it's that's how Tomlin treats all uh, I mean, rookies and a lot of new players. I mean, remember, I mean, he'll, he'll make jokes about the remember the way he was Najee going at his first camp. I mean, that's, you know, Tomlin will build you up, but he'll also do these like kind of, you know, just joshing with you, almost like negging comments to like, you know, make it so you don't get too, too uh, full of yourself, which is what I took the context of the uh, I could throw to George line. That's right. You know, we don't send messages. We just make moves. Yeah, uh, he, he said somewhere. Why can't I find that one? Okay, enough. Uh, how about this? At Steel mm. Curtain app. Steel Curtain. Uh, B, uh, Barstool Radio thinks the Steelers' biggest weaknesses are as follows. Number one, wide receiver. Number two, quarterback. Number three, cornerback. Um, you know, cornerback, uh, I'll say, yeah, we don't know exactly what we have, especially after... Uh, Porter and Jackson. Yeah. Well, um, we receive. I guess that's the same with the receiver. Would you? You know, how do you agree on these on these three biggest I, weaknesses? I'd have wide receiver number one. I'd have. Uh, I, I, I mean, the defensive line is good, but it's so old. Yeah. Like, and it's also not deep at all. So I would probably have that at three and quarterback four. Just I, I don't know. The quarterback is a weakness right now. I mean, they don't have a. 22 year old franchise hall of fame track quarterback but they're in a better place than they were a season ago so i don't know if i see that as the biggest weakness i would probably have i mean i guess since it's so important i would have to have it three i do think it wide receivers clearly number one and then i don't know but everyone loves uh, dante jackson at camp everyone said how great he's been so we'll see but uh I mean, it's it's it, it, that's not too far off, but I just think wide receiver is so much a bigger glaring need that it's almost like so far ahead of the other two that it feels ridiculous to put all three weaknesses together. What is that? Um, yeah, it's more like not weaknesses, but question marks. Yeah, you know, or maybe inexperience in the offensive line. Maybe that's the second that's, biggest weakness. That's yeah, that yeah. might fit. It- <laughs> um. Okay, and uh, we we got the uh, first. Uh, depth no we got the first depth chart Mm -hmm. at davis will underscore 4085 will Mm -hmm. davis Mm -hmm. more starting left tackle fautanu his backup broderick jones at right tackle i simply don't understand this coaching staff oh my the first uh depth chart is out and uh kind of what (laughs) time to get mad about that we kind of expected this i at least you know uh for it until you know, we see them on the field in September. We right. didn't think that the rookies would get be you know exactly. automatic starters, a coronation. You know, right? That's that's they, they they did that with Kendrick Green, and it did not go well. So yes, that that's fine. They have been playing Fahutano more at right tackle, but uh, I'd rather uh, he earns it versus just saying, "Hey, here's in since you were drafted in the first round, here's the first uh, depth chart." No, it. Uh, besides, let them play a whole bunch with like the second team on Friday night. Isn't that what? a rookie should do that's not a quarterback or a wide receiver or something of that ilk. Uh, yeah, okay. How about one last thing on camp? Hey. At Chad Tyson, Chad Tyson, WDVE. Good times at Dino's in Latrobe this afternoon. We've got the uh, the table. It's Mike Tomlin, his son, uh, Jay Glazer, Fox mm. Sports, and... Brett Michaels from Poison. This is the brunch bunch, I guess. Or um, uh, what do you? Are they eating a bunch of popcorn? What is that in front of Brett? That's just a whole bunch of popcorn. Skinny, skinny (laughs) Brett Michaels is definitely a passing on the wings. Um, Hey, Jay Glazer's lost some weight too. Jay looks a lot better than I remember from last year. um, Yeah. What do you think this conversation is all about at this table? I don't know. It just, I mean, it might just be like a super fun lunch where everyone does everything they can not to mention football. Like it might be one of those that, 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 that's what I like to imagine. It's just talking about, Hey, how are you doing? How you been? What a fun time. You know what I mean? Just kind of sitting in the moment versus talking about anything football, but that might just be me. What about you? Do you have an uh, <laughs> what this conversation is? Like- I just can't imagine. I mean, 
Tomlin is of the age to know poison, but I just right. can't imagine that they, they're talking rock and roll. <laughs> His son probably knows him more as uh, Rock of Love or whatever. A thousand, or just in the context as a Steelers fan. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. I, 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 the, the son would know him. Yeah. I mean, just as like a classic rock person at best. But you're right. If his son knows him at all as a celebrity, it would be from the reality show. And then the DVE crew, of course, you know, I mean, like, all right, guys, we're eating here. Can you get out of here? Right, right, right. Exactly. You, you took the picture. It, it's, it's time to go. At, uh, right, because these other four – there is something. But it also just hit me. It could be like that, you know, Jay Glazer, Tomlin and Tomlin's son, all do have a relationship. And they know each other. And, talk. Yeah. and Brett Michaels is just like the guy that just kind of like the fourth wheel, just kind of hanging out. And like they tell him all the stories and in-jokes and things. That could be a nice dynamic, too. He was Jay's plus one at camp, and oh. but then if you saw other videos, the bar, everyone chilling at the bar wants to talk to Brett Michaels, and Tomlin is like <laughs> by himself, like who is this guy uh, in the white shirt, you know? Um, but That's man, funny. I would have liked to have been there, you know. Oh yeah, and I would have eat chicken wings. Yeah, I think Tomlin ordered the chicken wings there. Um, that would have been a fun lunch. Okay, one last thing here, Uh-oh. which is I think the, you know, if you're going out of your way for, uh, I don't know, you're trying to farm farm clicks or attention or something, <laughs> this is the way to do it. Nice. The final word, the disingenuous tweet of the week from, doesn't, doesn't matter, no, <laughs> at, at dad of two kids, hmm. C. I ask candidates who in, whom interview for me if they consider Mike Tomlin to be a successful head coach. The answers allow me insight to how they think. Most subpar performers think he's successful. The superstars do not. <laughs> consider me uh, unqualified for this position, whatever company he's running. I can't imagine a serious employer being like, okay, uh, what do you think about Mike Tomlin? Your whole career weighs on this question. <gasps> Just imagine a very serious business interview and someone asking you about football coaches. <laughs> I mean, that, that, to me, when I saw this, and maybe this is because I've seen too much of this nonsense online, even on Instagram, there's a whole lot of, like, alpha male philosophy. And this very much reeks of that. Like, it's this is how you can be the perfect man. A sigma top tier operator. And then you, you know, anything that's not winning all the time means you're not a man. And that's sort of what I read from this. But I, I could be reading reading too much into uh, this person who's apparently just has some kind of, uh, I assume runs a small business and gives some of the weirdest interviews that people coming in from Craigslist or LinkedIn have ever been on. Yeah, you, I, pl I wish I could get this question on an interview. I would find <laughs> ace it. If I was hiring and someone just said, oh, you know, Tomlin, no playoff wins in seven years, blah, blah, blah. I would think, oh, this guy's a sheep. And I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm right. not, I'm this not hiring gonna him. This guy's going to spend all his day online picking up what he reads there. Do I want to hire this? This guy oh man uh, and ever since i saw that tweet now he's been popping up in my feed it's oh, just geez. when are we gonna stop doing this to mike Tomlin? exactly come on come on he's about to put together the greatest uh, trade in steelers history <laughs> uh not since mika fitzpatrick so okay um i think that is about it uh for today is that what we've been talking about that's what we've been talking oh, about. Oh, okay, great. Um, please give us some iTunes reviews. Yes. We need to get some eyeballs on here. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we got a couple new subscribers on YouTube. I appreciate that. Um, but, you know, we, tell, a, tell a friend to tell a friend or mm -hmm. something. Oh, yes. You know, especially as the, the we're back into the game Since time. The season is coming. It's here. You I mean, don't, it's you're, here. You're, if you're tired of these Brandon Ayuk reports, ah! then you want to come to the source that tells it like it is mm -hmm. which uh, you know or like it should be maybe <laughs> i don't know i'm kyle Kreis on tiktok greg how about yourself uh, i'm on instagram at greg benevent b as in boy e n e, -E v as in victor e n t almost forgot my name there for a second you'll you can catch us actually not this saturday but right. uh a week from saturday at flappers comedy club in mm -hmm. burbank yes um if you you know if you happen to be out on the west coast i don't think any of our listeners are so <laughs> i mean we put that out there just in case maybe you have a layover maybe you're thinking i don't know what to do on a saturday night i'm in la for some reason we'll be glad to take care of you 
All right, until next week when we can actually talk about something that happened in a game. Man, imagine that. Wow, keep wow. listening to your coach. Be the best selves, that's gonna be required. Stay in school.